So let's begin. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, class today on a Friday. I'm grateful to be able to be able to address this issue of Indigenous uh, child welfare today. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in this class are issues concerning residential schools and child welfare systems, and then we're going to be looking at something called the best interests of the child test as uh, developed and applied by the Supreme Court of Canada and lower courts. In the next class, when we deal with this issue, we're going to be talking more about self-governance initiatives of uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities, and the challenges that they face trying to deal with uh, this legacy of um, high rates of children being placed out of their homes for over 150 years. Um, so the background here talks about some of the things that we're going to be discussing. Uh, the historical idea of tradition and how tradition itself continues to function as a resource for reasoning to try to understand, unpack, uh, deal with some of these challenges. Then we'll look at the historical context of uh, child welfare in terms of stereotypes that Indigenous peoples have long faced concerning their children, and then the residential schools experience, and then finally this residential schools um, settlement agreement. Uh, following that, we'll look at the 60s scoop, uh, the moving in of the social services system as child welfare services started to shut down. You have a replacement uh, system in many respects that ends up having the same result for Aboriginal children. Now they're not going to residential schools, they're largely going to uh, foster uh, placement uh, systems. Um, then after we look at this 60 scoop, we'll look at the contemporary realities of the over-representation of Aboriginal children in uh, foster uh, placements, care arrangements, and then we'll see the link to uh, children being outside of the home, um, being forged to an institutionalization of Aboriginal children as they move through their later teens and into their adult years. And then uh, the last part of the course is this, uh, of course, this uh, lecture today is the best interest of the child test that was seen in Wood's case. Uh, we'll look at the importance of cultural heritage um, through the court's eyes and then have uh, that more firmly be put in our sights to deal with issues of interracial so-called adoption. So that's the map of where we're going today. So first of all, to look at this idea of tradition, I want to tell a story, I want to give a case. And in doing so, this case is about children and might give you some sense as to how Indigenous peoples might go about um, dealing with the challenges of uh, this um, sadness that's in many communities relating to children. Um, this, this case, this story though, is also about how you and I might practice Indigenous law, how we might go about learning in community contexts where we're not quite sure what to do to deal with uh, issues of reform. So this story, this case, has many layers attached to it. There's some scholars that have identified something called the Ojibwe precept ambiguity. Right? The, the idea that you would purposely cultivate ambiguity in trying to uh, forge a path of legal, social, political, economic reform. It's quite frustrating for those that aren't used to functioning in the world of ambiguity and want to nail things down to a ratio or a rule or a statutory provision, but this kind of precept ambiguity enhances your own agency, being able to draw an interpretation from what's found in the stories. It also enhances a collective's uh, sense of agency as they find that they have a role in participating in what the answer to the question might be, not giving it to the parliament, the judge, some external body to be able to say, here's the way you need to approach something. 
So this story is about Nana Bojo, the Nana Bush, the trickster character amongst the uh, Ojibwe. They're tricksters that talked about all across the country, badger, coyote, old man, spider, glooscap, the seekajack, uh, Nana Bush, raven, others. So Nana Bush has used a role as walking through the forest. He's very hungry. He's never satisfied. He never can quite fill all his appetites that he has. And he's looking for food. As uh, he comes uh, through a very dense part of the forest, he eventually stumbles upon an open clearing. And it looks beautiful. In fact, you can see across the clearing to the other side that it borders on a lake. So there he is, standing at that clearing, looking across the meadow, seeing the water sparkle in the sun beyond. He looks up. He sees that the clearing is surrounded by rich, dark pine trees, some cedar trees, some maple, uh, birch, other kind of Great Lake woodlands uh, uh, trees. He looks up further. He sees the moon is also up in the middle of the day, hanging in the sky. And he just marvels at the beauty of that moment. But as he takes it in, he realizes that something's not quite right. This is a beautiful day, and he sees in the clearing all of these houses, wigwam, uh, as we uh, call them, all of these bark-covered homes that should be the site of great activity and uh, lots of commotion given the time of day it was and given how bright, beautiful, and warm it is outside. And so he wonders, what's going on here? Why is there no seeming life? So he stands for a while at the edge of the village, taking it in, just kind of watching, wondering what's happening. After a while, he decides to take four steps into the clearing and looks at it from that perspective and then starts to circumnavigate the clearing uh, going around, uh, checking out what's happening in those houses from the different angle as he's walking around. As he's also there, he peers into the forest every once in a while. As he gets to the beach, because the clearing is on the side of that lake, he notices all of these canoes and nets and other paraphernalia that should be used by the community, some needing repair. And again, this is a beautiful day for engaging in that, and there's none of that activity occurring. Things are just kind of um, sitting there, uh, going to waste, uh, not in their best condition. So he continues to walk around the community with these different angles until he comes back to where he started. And he's not really sure what he's seeing and why he's seeing this in the way that it is, and he listens doesn't quite get it, thinks some more, and then he takes four more steps into the clearing, which brings him closer to some of those structures, and he starts walking around the clearing, doing the same thing as he's done before, and again, not really getting any clue as to what's going on in this place. So he comes back to where he began, that first time, now he's finished his second circumnavigation of the field, the clearing. Again, he stops, thinks about what's, what's going on, takes four more steps into the village, and now he's made his uh, way in quite some way. And this time, as he's circumnavigating around the village, he finds himself weaving in and out of those wigwam that are in that field there. And he listens, and he hears some activity inside. Really low, mumbled speech, kind of hollow sounds, picking up a little bit of a clue what's there, but still nothing distinct. Finally, back to where he started. Now he's gone around this the third time. Uh, this time, he takes uh, four steps into the center of the place and starts walking around the wigwam again. And this time, every once in a while, he'll stop and he'll look at the structures. And there's one time where he takes the, the um, leather flap that's covering one of the doors and he throws it back. And he, he, he leans down to um, look at what's inside. 
and it's dark. But as his eyes start to adjust to the light, he sees all of these brown eyes looking back at him. And he sees all of these people just kind of slumped against the wall, not saying anything. And he notices that there's an old woman sitting by the wall near the door. And um, he says, Nokomis, what's going on here? Why is everyone inside on this beautiful day? Why is no one out? Why are you all just sitting here? There's nets that need repair, boats that need attention. There's beauty to be had. Why are you sitting here? She looks up at him, doesn't say anything for quite a while. Eventually, she says, none of us, it's our children. They are so sad. No one is willing to even move a muscle because our children just seem so broken. She looked around at the people in the lodge. They nodded in agreement, nod. Nanabush saw this. He closes the flap. He then, having heard that, walks to the center of the circle, center of the clearing. Usually there's a fire in the center, and there is a fire there, but there's just a few embers. It's mostly ashes. There's a few wisps of smoke that are way, making their way up above the circle. And he thinks of what he's heard. He thinks of what he's seen. He thinks about the different angles that he's had on this. And he starts to listen, because he hears something as he's standing there in the quiet, something that sounds like laughter. And it's such a contrast to what's there in the village. And it's such a contrast to what's there in the houses, that he wants to follow it. He wants to get to that source of laughter. So he walks out of the village from the opposite direction from which he entered. And he walks, so he walks through the clearing, gets to the forest, steps into the forest, and starts stumbling and following his way to the sound of laughter. Eventually, he comes across a river little stream actually. This is a little stream that's flowing down into that lake. And he inclines his ear again and he notices that it's coming from a little ways up the stream. So he follows it until he comes to its source. And what it is, is all of these bright colored pebbles that are rolling over one another in the current. And as they roll over one another against the rock bottom, in the current with the water gurgling, it sounds for all the world like laughter. He wonders what he can do. So he thinks for a while and then he reaches into the cold stream and starts gathering some of these rocks. And he takes these rocks and he puts it in a little pouch that he holds uh, with him and he walks back to the center place of the clearing been standing there around that fire. Again, those almost out, the wisps are almost gone. And he calls, Widu Kaoshin, help me. No sound, just the wind, the water, a few birds. Second time, Widu Kaoshin, help me. And at this point, a couple of the flaps in the wigwams open up and they see Nanabush standing there. But no one pays attention. It's Nanabush after all, the trickster. They just close the flaps. He's not timing though. Again, he calls out, Widu Kaoshin, help me. Again, some of the flaps open and Nanabush notices that some of the elders some of the grandmothers, some of the grandfathers, they start to join Nanabush there at that circle around that fire. So there's a handful of people at that point. He calls out a fourth time, Wido Kao Shin, help me. This time the flaps open up again. They've heard the noise from the past time as people walk to the center and they see their elders standing with Nanabush there, at least a few of them. With the elders there, people feel inclined to be able to respect the fact
fact that they've gathered. And so the rest of the village starts slowly making their way out of their shelters to stand with Nanabush in that site. Now they're looking at one another, no one's saying anything across from this almost extinct fire. And Nana Bojo reaches into his pouch and he pulls out a handful of all of these bright colored rocks that he gathered at the stream. And he holds them out like this for everyone to look at. And they kind of go, what? Like they don't know what he's getting at. And uh, then Nana Bojo, after some time of silence, he takes those rocks, goes like this, and he hurls them up into the air. And the people, they kind of step back and think, oh, Nana Bush has done it again. He's playing a rotten trick on us. He's hurled up all these rocks. They're going to rain down on our head. We're going to be hurt. He's just trying to bring pain and misery to us when we're already full of pain and misery. So they brace themselves <coughs> for this onslaught. And as the rocks go up, uh, it's going to hurt even more the higher they get. And so they're there. But as they're up at their highest point, at the zenith, a wind comes across the clearing from out on the lake and starts to catch those rocks. And all of a sudden, they're transformed. They become these blue, yellow, turquoise, orange, other colors that start swirling around the fire there in the middle of the clearing. And the young ones that are there, the little kids, their eyes go wide. They can't believe what they're seeing. And every once in a while, one of those colors comes down close to them, and they try to grab a hold of it, but it just escapes out of their reach. Another one comes close, they try to grab a hold, and escapes out of their reach. Before you know it, they're on both hands up in the air, kind of jumping up and down, trying to catch all these little colors that are um, just catching the light, catching the wind just above their heads. And as this occurs, they start jostling with one another, bumping one another, and laughter starts coming out of them. And as they start to laugh, the dog that had previously been all morose and just lying as if they were dead, and they start to pick up their interest. And they start to yelp and bark a bit at the children's uh, heels as they're all laughing. They're trying to grab and grasp what's above them. And as this occurs, the parents and the elders start looking at one another and they see happiness in their children's faces. And with that, smiles start to come across their own faces. The scene being very different from what was there when Nanabush first entered that circle. This is our story of the first of butterflies. The the, uh, uh, and the first butterflies being those rocks that were transformed by Nanabush. Now, precept ambiguity, what does this story mean? Right? There's lots of different stories and meanings that could be given to this depending on your perspective, depending on your own correlation with uh, other stories. But I did say that this is a story about dealing with indigenous uh, child welfare issues. I also said this might be a story concerning how you practice law in an indigenous context. In other words, I've just given you um, civil procedure from an Anishinaabe perspective. Um, and you can see in that civil procedure, there's a pattern, there's a way to be able to approach these issues perhaps. As you've listened, just briefly here, I invite you to tell me what you think this story might mean either for uh, child welfare in terms of the specifics of the story or for the practice of Anishinaabe law anyway. Ideas? Yes. So the elders were the first ones to come into the circle, and until people saw the elders there, the rest of the community would not respond to what Nanabush was 
attempting to do. And so there's that uh, principle. Yes? The children are like the heart of the, like the, heart of the community. This readings for this uh, week uh, talk about children being gifts, right, from the spirit world. And if they're not treated well, they could depart uh, quite quickly from this world. And so because uh, those children were so sad, everyone else was sad, the heart of the community was on the ground as long as the children's hearts were on the ground. Other points here? Yes. That's right. Finding joy and restoring balance in terms of both practicing love, imagine having joy and practicing love, but also finding joy in the place of our community. That's what's our intent. That was, that's what needs to be restored. Yes, children and families need to be reunited, but that needs to occur in a context that's not just bureaucratic and technocratic, uh, but also has joy as a part of it. And a little joy like starts off by listening and observing. So yes. Kind of go into the middle right away. Yes. So Nanabush doesn't go into the middle right away. Right, he starts out by observing, watching, thinking, right? really looking at this problem from different angles, taking clues from what's uh, there in the physicality of the community. And then, of course, he eventually talks to people in the community to figure out uh, what's going on there, what's going on. Other points? So imagine going into a, a community, someone asks for your legal advice. You could go in with opinions. You've learned a lot uh, in this uh, course. You've learned a lot in law school. You've learned a lot over the course of your life. But there's still room here for recognizing that you need to be open to understanding, as Nana Bush is trying to be open here to understand what's going on. It's so easy to rush in with an opinion. This is what needs to happen. This is not uh, what occurred in this instance. It's not that you don't bring your skills and your abilities to that, but maybe part of your skills and abilities are issue identification, right? Being able to look at this from different angles and then being able to interview clients, talk with the elders, talk with people that are there. It's another big part of this. Other elements. So the fact that as much of the community as could be invited to the fire was there to be able to deal with the issue is an important part of the answer to this question. You weren't just dealing with um, kind of cohorts or um, sort of breakout groups as much as possible. Deal with the uh, community as part of it. Yes. And finding joy in the natural world. Like you went to the stream and found the pebbles. Yeah. Finding joy in the natural world, linking to the pebbles. What I find interesting about that is it could be, now this can be overstated and generalized and being put off track, but it could be that the things that we need to be able to cause or bring about reform are already there somewhere at our feet. And what we need to do is take what's already present and and find ways to transform it. Um, that's, I think, part of the message, and my own read of this, is Nanabush listened for and watched for what was around, took from the surrounding context, and then um, transformed <coughs> that uh, context. Yes? Also, the 
something he could do alone. It's something that he needed everyone there uh, to be able to help him. Other points? This is a good point. There was an intervention there by another force to help that transformation come to pass. You don't always know when you take an action how it's going to turn out. Certainly the people in the circle didn't know. We don't know about Nanabush, whether or not he knew. He's a trickster after all. So here's a point. Lawyers as tricksters. Right? Sometimes we think we are being good in the world and actually can bring that to pass, but it could be that the things that we carry with us are as harmful, if not more harmful, than helpful. Um, I think that the fact that the way we have managed, many of us managed to get the people out of their sort of neutral or situation was asking them to help him, and that they weren't looking after their own interests, they were so bummed out that they couldn't get, but they were still deep down willing to get it together to help someone else out. That is so when you recognize that people who even down and out have the ability to do things, have an expertise, as we talked about last time uh, when we're dealing with Indigenous women, and if they get involved and help out, um, the activation of their own um, place, their own agency, uh, can be very significant in dealing with the problem. They're not just all helpless, passive victims. There is a role, even in constrained circumstances that people can uh, take. I think one of the other things is, is knowing when to be quiet mm -hmm. and, and listen, you know, and, and, and seek clarification um, to make sure you're understanding yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Because too often we think we have the answer and, and we might Knowing when to be silent is really powerful in this field in particular. It's kind of awkward because you might be called to come and assist a community, you're on an hourly billable rate, or you're on a salary, and you've got resources and institutions and knowledge behind you. Again, the idea might be to just go in and fix the thing, um, but there's a tension there. Because I've found in my own 50-year you know, experience and certainly in my 30-year professional experience, the best way to often deal with this is start out as a fly on the wall. Okay. If you can pick up by osmosis the patterns, the customs, the implicit as well as the explicit things that are going on there, you become a much greater aid and help to that community than just rushing into the center and trying to solve it. But you can see how that's not the way law firms are set up to operate. That's not how governments set up to operate. It takes a different kind of an investment. Uh, but it is something that you can do. Um, generations now of students that I've taught have done this. Uh, it is possible to practice in this area which has a different sense of time about it. Now, that's not an excuse if they want an answer right away and they call upon you and the clock is running to just you know, jack up the hours and stay there forever, being a fly on the wall. I'm not about abstractions and generalizations for all times and purposes you act in the way I'm describing. But that would be wrong. I always have to put it into context. But part of the context that's often missing is this context that Nana Bush is teaching here because the skill you're mostly learning in law school is that other one. So we I'm going to assume that that's going to be really well honed and crafted by the time you graduate from law school, go with article, start to practice. But this other skill is something that you could develop simultaneously by participating in communities, uh, with friends, uh, in uh, different fora that uh, have your, your professional life be layered. Right? Most lawyers volunteer. 
and so the proto pro bono is one of the ways that that can occur is it put you on a different time schedule in some of your life circumstances. There's a sort of speaker hum that happens in this room that's happening now. I think it has something to do with the volume over there. It's the volume. It's some sort of game. I don't know. Does anyone else drive the music a little? Thank you. <laughs> No, that's good. Other things to say? I think we've all we've covered the point by and large. We've spent like 20 minutes on it, but half an hour already. Okay. We've learned law today. It's just a different way of thinking about law. Uh, what indigenous, in this case, Anishinaabe law might uh, hold for thinking about this issue. So now let's uh, go to um, the ideas that are found in the materials around some of the stereotypes that are present in relationship to the historical uh, context. Um, you, have probably, you probably remember reading that when missionaries and settlers and traders encountered indigenous peoples, they thought that they were very irresponsible in regard to their children. Uh, many communities refused to um, use physical punishment to discipline uh, their children. That there was a sense that it was wrong to coerce or humiliate an individual publicly, and therefore the child um, was treated like an adult in many instances, expected to exercise choice and agency in judgment, even though that might be not well refined in that uh, younger period, and they could get themselves into trouble. So that's one part of those stereotypes. Another part of the stereotype was that it, there was a lot of public uh, displays of affection, like PDAs going out. Right? All of this love and kissing and hugging and kind of being physical with children was regarded as very wrong by early uh, um, settlers. It wasn't in accord with the way children were treated in uh, much of uh, Victorian society and uh, pre-Victorian society at the time. Uh, the idea of ceremonies accompanying this uh, public uh, display was also regarded as being very uh, detrimental to children. And so early European and French uh, missionaries, traders, uh, um, observers, uh, given the deficiencies that they saw in child rearing practices, uh, sought to take them into their own care, either through uh, conversion processes, um, early industrial school processes, uh, the, the fur trading rule. And when the state itself uh, began to deal with Indians, as we saw last class with the Gradual Civilization Act, Indians were regarded as wards of the federal government. Indians were regarded as children that needed um, discipline and being put right in terms of how um, you, know, you should deal with your family, deal with your children, uh, put things in place. This paternalistic uh, view um, was picked up uh, by the civil service and uh, early in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, uh, you see these things happening in, uh, in the federal sphere. Um, you have visits to the United States by federal officials to try to figure out what to do with the Indians, and there they come across that boarding school phenomena or the residential school phenomena. There's this Nicholas Davin who was sent to the Americans. There was a conviction that the Americans were right in the way they were dealing with Indians, and he reports back, uh, if anything is to be done with the Indian, we must catch him very young. That is, we're going to kill the Indian by killing the child, the, the Indian child, so that that person becomes raised in a way that's not Indian. And so you get, up the, you get the setting up of these residential schools, these boarding schools, which come against the backdrop of the Indian as the vanishing race. There was often metaphors that were talked about 
as, you know, just as civilization rises like the sun and melts away all of the dew and frost off the grass, so the British rising like the sun will cause the Indians to fade away, to melt away like the dew or the frost off the grass. And that was very much a part of the discussion. You see in the iconography uh, many of these ideas of the, of the, the end of the trail sense of uh, Indians. Duncan Campbell Scott, as we've already talked about, superintendent of Indian Affairs, our object is to continue until there's not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body, body politic, and there's no Indian question, no Indian department. That is the whole object of this bill. So, you set up this residential school process to remove children from the influences of their parents. And so you send them to these schools far away from home. Sometimes kids can get out for two months at a time in the summer, but sometimes they're there through the entire year, sometimes they're there through 10 and 12 years. And when they're there, they're subject to a total cultural control assembly line. Um, children, I think I've talked about this before, often would dress their children up in their best clothes, um, you know, maybe beading their moccasins, putting their hair in beautiful braids, with threats and then shining them all up, you know, just go and learn. And they would get there and their clothes would be taken from them, often burned, because it was worried that there was bugs in them. The kids would be doused with lye. They would have their braids cut. Um, and then they would be clothed identical to one another in the uniforms of the residential school. Now that's if the children actually had a choice of sending their kids to school. Often parents did not want to send their kids, especially once word got out of what was happening, and you would try to hide your kids at all costs to prevent them from going in. And so you get lots of people running away or going into the bush, or when they get there, the kids will uh, run away. So this constant uh, attempt, because not only are the kids' clothes changed and their identities changed, they're that as Indians they're inferior, that the culture that they come from is savage. They're made to be ashamed of their background. And in that shaming place, um, if they do return home, there's this sense that there's a distance there between them and the generations that have stayed. Or if they do return home, they think they have something to teach those that are there that are less than, or they're just, there's this, confusion about who you are given that you respect your parents, you respect your culture, but you've been told other things by uh, these teachers. Violence was a big part of what occurred in the school. There was a, almost a military discipline to the schools, and this discipline was enforced by corporal punishment, as occurred in many parts of the country. It wasn't only the Indians that were being singled out in that way, but it was the case that that discipline was also there in the broader context of being made to feel inferior around your particular uh, people group. I think the, the important part of that, though, is, is when they moved about in the European homes, they also have parents beside them that will give them some form of affection mm -hmm. and, and console them, whereas when we were in school, and children as young as two and four, up to my age and older, you know, you had no contact with your parents from the time you left home until you went home again, if your parents could afford to take you home. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that that difference, you know, The lack of affection and warmth and human bodily love uh, was not a part of the residential school experience by and large. Um, and you couple that then with the abuse 
but then where there's another part of the system, you've got this quote here on the top of 179 from a survivor of the Alberni residential school. The elimination of language was a part of this. My father, it said by this person that testified before the Royal Commission, who attended Alberni residential school for four years in the 20s, was physically tortured by his teachers for speaking Kisha. They pushed sewing needles through his tongue, a routine punishment for many language offenders. The needle torture suffered by my father affected all my family. I have six brothers and sisters. My dad's attitude became, why teach my children Indian if they're going to be published, punished for speaking it? So he would not allow my mother to speak Indian to us in his presence. I never learned to speak my own language. I am now therefore truly a dumb Indian. Going after the culture as a part of the discipline in a quite a harsh way was intentional. And then this was not the intent of Ottawa or the people that set up the residential schools, but the, 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 the visual and sexual abuse that took place as uh, residential schools were unfolding is just horrendous. Um, I still can't believe because it just seems so overwhelming to me that I don't want to believe it, but I do. Sexual abuse was rampant in these institutions of um, those that were in the those that were charged with taking care of children. Not everyone, by any means, was sexually abused. But in the claims process, um, two out of five uh, applicants uh, came forward with uh, allegations of uh, sexual abuse, and it's devastating. My elders, Basil Johnson, who I talk about near the end of his life, started to disclose the abuse that he suffered. It changed his entire life, uh, as it did most of the elders. Most of the people that are a generation older than me have either been directly or indirectly affected um, as a result of uh, these experiences. This um, is why you have partially the dysfunction, why you have the claims that you see occurred in the last few years. Now, I do want to make this point about generalization again. Some people did have good experiences in residential schools. So I told you about Judge Scow, and when he went, got an education, was able to then go on to university, become a practicing lawyer. We talked about how people made connections with one another across a wide swath of Canada so that when they went back to the reserves, they had connections with one another. Um, and, and, and people are resilient. Um, Basil talked about when they were put on potato duty and they had to just peel mounds of potatoes, they would break up into the Maple Leafs and the Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. And they would peel potatoes to see who got the most, to see if the Blackhawks or the Maple Leafs would want to win. There was also a lot of pranksterism that went on to try to subvert that authority in ways that only kids can do, but sometimes that prankstering was quite ineffective in holding dignity uh, within uh, young kids. So, you know, we have to be complex about the presentation of this story, um, but part of that complexity is the horror of it as well not to ignore that, even as we tell other better stories that are uh, part of these experiences. There was an apology, as you know, for um, that uh, um, subject. And here you have, I think it was about 130 uh, schools um, that were spread across Canada um, as part of the Indian residential schools phenomena. 80 operated in their height, which I think was in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and then in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, people start to come forward with all these allegations of abuse. So a class action was launched. This class action um, ended up uh, being so powerful that it started to put some of the congregations into bankruptcy because the litigants would challenge not only the government for perpetuating the system, but also the churches who were complicit in running these systems. And some of those churches as awards of damages were 
given to them, they have to sell their assets. And in selling their assets, that was putting some of them in, into bankruptcy. So this class action eventually went into settlement, a negotiation, and uh, that negotiation ended up in an Indian residential schools agreement, a common experience, uh, $20,000 if you're in the school, an independent assessment process for claims of sexual or serious physical abuse. Notice, there's not a claim for cultural abuse here. You had your language taken, you couldn't make a claim under the assessment. There were measures created to be able to support healing, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. There were commemorative activities, witnessing events, um, part of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which just reported out um, last, uh, about five or six months ago, uh, was an element of this. Over 100,000 people were part of this uh, uh, class. And uh, it, um, there's no corner of the country that's not been affected by this. The apology says um, <clears throat> two primary objectives of the residential school were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, it was infamously said to kill the Indian and the child. Today, we recognize this policy of assimilation was wrong and has, gone, has caused great harm and has no place in our country. And you can read further uh, that apology um, about recognizing the forcible removal, the deprivations, the deaths, the inadequate food, clothing and housing, because these kids often have to provide for their own food by actually working half of the day in farms and other craft ventures that were around um, the area. Okay. Didn't really agree with that. My father was 11 years old, and he was harmed. They taught him how to make bread, and that's his job the rest of the life. But he made 200 loaves of bread a day. And during the summer, when they didn't come home, they would be out to the hop fields and picking hops for the farmers in, in Beaver Valley, in Fraser Valley. You know, Most 11 years, 11 years old. old. My, I, I think I told you my mother ran away from home because people were going to residential school. She didn't want to be swept up in that, and uh, ended up picking tobacco at 14 around Tilsonburg, Ontario, all through the summers. Uh, but then feeling guilty that she ran away, because then her younger siblings had to go to residential school and thought, if only was, I was there, maybe I could have saved them. The, most people graduated from uh, residential school, even if they went to grade 12, it would be the equivalent of a grade five education because they were spending their time picking hops and baking bread and um, you know, doing domestic uh, labor or uh, agricultural labor. I might sound rational, I'm very angry. <laughs> this is a very, very harmful, hurtful thing. The point though, um, we all deal with anger differently. What I deal with it is try to channel it towards something productive. Um, I think the facts speak for themselves. I don't have to stand here and rage that it's just there in the materials. I don't need to embroider this in any degree. So there was a mixed uh, experience of getting that independent assessment. Uh, some people were quite satisfied because they finally had an opportunity to tell their story. Someone listened, and they were um, they verified what it is that they were doing. In other cases, though, they had to prove. Well, when did this happen? Who was there? What were the circumstances of this? You know, the, the assessment process did try to create a relaxed. Um, environment of proof, 
that uh, is not the high standard of uh, court, but nevertheless, people were asked to have a, a degree of proof, and uh, and sometimes that was a revictimization for people that went through the independent assessment experience. Again, I don't want to be generalizing about this, but that is some people's experiences that there was a revictim, or even if they weren't revictimized, just the fact that they had to dredge up something that was 70, 80 years old and relive that caused, it's like you know pulling off that band-aid, it's not really healed, the wound is there again. I'm wondering if there's not just a minimal use of the, the right to participate, if there's yeah. any action taken against the community at this point? Um, was any action taken against people who were still living in terms of these allegations of abuse that were coming forward? If they did yeah. find that, that action would be taken. That's right, and so there could be criminal charges that were brought uh, in that instance. Yes? Um, because it's wrapped up now, if someone didn't come forward before, is that just it? I mean, they can't get... Yeah, so anymore. because this is not wrapped up now, if someone didn't come forward at that time, can they now uh, bring that claim? It's very difficult for them because this was meant to solve that. The Minister of Justice is looking into, I understand, the fact that Newfoundland wasn't included in uh, the residential school statement, and there were Indians in Newfoundland that went to residential schools, so there could be other avenues that open up. And of course, none of this dealt with the cultural abuse. You can still go through the regular legal system, um, but there are, I'm not sure about the NBL, but there are hurdles to that. Um, but I just, I just can't tell you what they are, because it's still not. So that's a history that should under, help us understand the 60s scoop, the current high outplacement of Aboriginal children into non-Aboriginal homes, because this went on for a hundred or so years. Um, in the 1960s, you get the rise of a, a middle class in Canada that's more fully urban. You get Aboriginal peoples in the 1950s and 60s starting to come from the reserves into the urban settings. You get Section 88 of the Indian Act that says all laws of general application applicable in the province by the Indians. And so there's an extension of child welfare law from the provincial side onto the Indian side without consideration, because again, you can't single out Indians, and without uh, having any cultural training on the part of those that are taking uh, kids into care. And often, kids are taken into care. Um, well, there's many reasons. Right? There's good reasons to take, take kids into care. If the parents are not able to provide the necessities of life uh, because of their own addictions or, or challenges, then by all means, those children are, should have received a, a more healthy uh, environment to be able to be raised in. And some of them were removed for that reason. But often, removals occurred, and you see in the materials, they still largely occur because it's thought that these parents are neglecting their children because they either are acting differently than the way, especially in the 1960s and 70s, it was regarded as good parenting would occur, this kind of permissive parenting that I talked about, survive for hundreds of years, and social workers would come in and be astonished that these kids weren't being disciplined in a kind of a... Western way, and that could be grounds for removal. Sometimes it was just the poverty of the family, because you're not able to provide food and clothing and uh, education like others. You would be sent to non-Indian homes. And this just got out of control. I mean, again, I want to say there, there were appropriate reasons for moving kids, but this other side of things got out of control, and uh, you get um, uh, many people have just adopted out, 70% uh, percent adopt into non-native homes, and the breakdown of transracial adoption is 70%. And we're gonna look at the Racine and Woods case in a moment, 
70% of those adoptions that occur um, uh, break down in that regard. And there's just, don't watch this film. It's there, but I linked it. It's just a heartbreaking account of the context of an era and what uh, this one young boy went to Alanis Obonsu and wrote the cry, Richard Cardinal, the cry from the diary of a Métis child, uh, talking about his experiences in, 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 in foster care. Some of these kids went into great homes and were loved and taken care of and have amazing lives. Really, they do and did. Some of these kids were taken into worse situations than they were forced out of when they were living in even more impoverished circumstances, or at least their parents loved them. Um, the, the clip from the Eight Fire era, um, CBC reporting, talks about um, there was too many instances of um, those homes not being uh, loving homes. Um, so the contemporary realities, overrepresentation in Manitoba, 50 to 60 percent of the kids in care today are Aboriginal. 50 to 60% in Saskatchewan are Aboriginal. Alberta, 60 to 70%. British Columbia, 50%. 50% right now of all the kids in care in this province are Indigenous kids. And there's kind of this other sort of institutionalization. Residential school shut down. Child welfare takes over. And then as the Manitoba Justice Inquiry reports, that sometimes this leads to another kind of institutionalization. Only 6% of kids in care graduate from high school as Aboriginal kids. 6%. So I, th I think it's 50% uh, for non-Aboriginal, for unprocessed statistics. Yeah, there we go. Only 7% graduate from high school uh, compared to 50% of Aboriginal children and 73% of non-Aboriginal children. So, um, for some of these kids, it's no surprise that, and I don't want to stereotype because not everyone takes this path just because they've had a hard upbringing. They don't. But poverty and abuse and neglect sometimes lead you to places where you're not acting in accordance with better economic opportunities, and so you engage in the drug trade, and you get involved in petty uh, criminal activity, and so they graduate from residential school to child welfare, and then from child welfare to the criminal justice system. So these statistical numbers here are like the numbers that we have for Aboriginal peoples in the criminal justice system. They mirror Aboriginal peoples in the child welfare system. When a child feels he's been thrown away, yeah. it's very difficult to feel that he deserves better. Yeah, when you feel like you've been thrown away, it's very difficult to feel like you deserve better. And so there's this spiral that can happen. It, this colors the life of Aboriginal communities all over the world. Aboriginal children also receive 22% less funding for education on reserve than non-Aboriginal children. And we don't have time, but if you want to watch this video of Cindy Blackstock, they brought an action against the federal government, claiming discrimination against the federal government for the way Indian kids are still treated here. And she did a freedom of information request. She, she's a PhD professor, teaches in Alberta, but bringing this action. There are over 2,000 pages of um, spying that occurred on her for trying to raise this issue um, with, the, uh, with the authorities. Uh, intimidation in many respects. They were trolling her Facebook page, trolling her accounts, uh, uh, trying to bring uh, you know, some kind of discrediting on her for raising these issues. And it's worthwhile watching. That's only about a five minute um, uh, sketch there. And so we now have this case, Racine v. Woods, which attempts to address the issue of 
the best interests of the child in the context of uh, child welfare. And so how are the courts uh, dealing with these issues? Um, the facts are uh, this woman, Letitia um, This woman had to give up her child uh, almost at birth because of the addictions that she was in and the abusive relationship that she was in. This little child was for a short time with her sister, but was eventually with this other family called uh, Racine. And um, the child um, eventually was returned to, Letitia, to her mother from the Racines. But then um, the mother, the, the natural mother, was still having difficulty in raising that child, so she gave the child back to the Racines with nothing formally done by the court. There was a point where the natural mother came back to try to get the child. She felt like she was being blocked from being able to take that child into care. The Racines story was, we love this child. We've been with this child for so long now. We didn't want to see her go with the natural mother without any plan. So four years pass, almost, and the Racines bring an order asking for a de facto adoption. Right? There's no paperwork. They ask for a de facto adoption, and they also claim, if they don't succeed on that ground, that um, the natural mother has abandoned the child. And it works its way through the court. Um, the court comes to the conclusion that there was a de facto adoption despite being no, no paperwork. And then there's a dispute about whether or not there was um, an abandonment. <coughs> now the court, at a certain level, said there's abandonment. This woman should have gone to court if she wanted to preserve the rights of being able to associate with her child. Um, and then there's a dispute about whether or not that was an appropriate thing to expect her to do, given the great distrust that Aboriginal peoples obviously have in the system, given what's now being uh, presented to you. Um, the court, though, in, in concluding that there was a de facto uh, adoption, um, said the finding of abandonment is not necessary. There's no parental consent needed to have a de facto adoption. The legislation itself said you have to take account of Aboriginal heritage factors in making a determination of adoption, the Court of Appeal would have allowed for open custody. That is, the child would be with Racine, the adoptive parents, but the natural mother would have had rights to access upon application. That's what the Court of Appeal would have done. The trial court and the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, we're not gonna have open custody. We need the finality of adoption here. There was an argument raised, but that finality of adoption doesn't pay attention to the cultural heritage factors that are so important and that are actually legislatively directed. The court, in addressing that issue, heard from uh, testimony of a Dr. McCray, which is on page 900 of the material. Um, the court accepts this and says, in my view, when the test to be met is the best interest of the child. The significance of cultural background and heritage, as opposed to bonding, abates over time. The closer the bond that develops with the prospective adoptive parents, the less important the racial element becomes. That's the court summarizing the expert's opinion. The expert says, I think this whole business of racial and Indian, or whatever you want to call it, has to do with the parameter of time. And if we've gone back to day one, when Leticia was living with her mother, priorities would have been different at that time. But this has been done, time goes by, the priority drops, that is of cultural heritage. The priority is no longer there, the priority of ethnic and cultural background. That drops and now must be way down because now it's the mother-child relationship. It doesn't matter if Sandra Racine was an Indian and the child was white, and Linda Woods was white, the same argument would hold. It has nothing to do with race, absolutely nothing to do with culture, it has nothing to do with ethnic background. It's two women and a little girl, and one of them doesn't know her. It's as simple as that. So this is the court's finding 
So why would B, we wouldn't consider the heritage of the child in this instance? Now I want to make clear that time is hugely important. I actually am not arguing against the results of this decision. Right? If someone's with someone for a long time, you don't want to go messing up that relationship. But I wonder about this reasoning. First of all, whether it's factually true, as I've shown you in that prior slide, so many of those adoptions end up breaking down. But even if it is factually true, might it not be the case, no, no, I'm not saying it's factually true, might it not be the case that at some point, ethnic and cultural heritage increases in importance to the child as they grow through their later teen years and into adulthood. When I go home to many communities, I see boards plastered with faces of people that are searching for their biological parents because they want to know who they are, who their mother and father is. There seems to be an heightening importance of that at a certain point in a teenager and adult, young adult's life. struck down the Western Party powers of two thousand and fourteen to allow them to make adjustments. Mm -hmm. They don't look at the charter rights of children involved. Mm -hmm. They're pre beings. They're not people yet in the eyes of the law. And we're not looking at what they want as people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just too many steps. Yeah, because it's not channeling that fact that they do have agency, right? As the um, earlier readings were trying to draw out the abstraction best interest, as important as that aspiration is, right? I'm not, who does, who can argue against that? Right? But the application doesn't always draw on that agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, is there is a, a clear indication that it couldn't apply to the Section 35 right of 2901? Yes. Uh, yeah, so it could have had aspirations. So that's a great point. Um, why is why can it be that child rearing is integral to distinctive cultural pride the arrival of Europeans, such that uh, you could find a role for others to get involved, kind of a triangulation process? Um, we're going to read this case as next class. That's not been successful because you can't prove that. That's how strict the Van der Poot case test is. You can't even say that your children and your child rearing practices of adults in relationship are that integral distinctive culture process, right? Okay. Um, I had a, a couple of things I was going to say. One kind of to counter the comment, because I had a similar experience as well when I was young, but very young, and I saw the parent um, participate in the community, and then I lived in a different neighborhood mm -hmm. for years. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say about Example shows that it uh, can be very important. Um, you feel like you don't know what you're missing until it's actually identified for you, perhaps. So I appreciate all these comments because it does show complexity, right? The Nana Bush story, you want to hold on to complexity. You don't want to jettison things on the basis of abstract principle. That's part of the problem.
So Professor um, Marley Klein has made the point in looking at this test, um, well, you can read. There's lots of critiques about this test by her on page 891, 901 Jim Anglin, 902 Patricia Montour, Patricia Montour says this is just forced assimilation all over again, uh, not being able to take account in a holistic way of the importance of a child's heritage through their life. Um, she called them racism. There's a lot of different opinions uh, in terms of how to deal with this. Next uh, cases have to do with this interracial adoption. So this uh, HD versus MH is really hard to read in the case itself from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, but what do you do if you've got a child that is born to a father who's African-American and a mother who's Aboriginal? What do you do in that case is what this case poses? And then the mother had it herself been adopted out and so that mother's children were being um, fought over. The question is who should, which grandparents should it go to? Should it go to the family that she was raised with that lived in Connecticut that were um, non-Aboriginal? Or should it go with her biological um, grandfather who's Aboriginal and living in Canada? There's just no quick question, easy way uh, through this. But part of what I want to suggest as a critique to this case um, is we shouldn't just view kids' ethnicity through a racialized lens. It seems to me that's what's happening in this case. Black, Indian as racial markers as opposed to uh, thinking about the political marker uh, in terms of um, the communities of which these peoples are a part. And this comes out more in the next case, uh, the Roy case. In the court, looking at this woman who's taken her child from California, contrary to a California court order to raise uh, these children amongst the Mi'kmaq, um, made comments like this. Um, um, these blonde, blonde, freckled twins would be held there out of reach of the law and their father that is on the reserve from October 95 to March 99. And their parents and children were literally indoctrinated into Indian culture. Um, these children were taught to live as outlaws. They were brainwashed away from the real, real world into a childlike myth of powwows and rituals, different from other children on the reserve who have regular contact. Um, and so there was a judicial complaint brought against this judge um, for the way that child rearing on the communities was being characterized. And the judicial council um, criticized the judge for making these statements that, were, that the council says were derogatory to Aboriginal culture, that implied the inherent inferiority of the Aboriginal community, that tried to measure these children by blood, saying that they weren't really Aboriginal if they had blonde hair and freckles. Um, it reflects an insensitivity towards Aboriginal children. The panel was criticizing the judge's idea of the mother's successful attempts to help her children learn about and experience Mi'kmaq uh, culture. The characterization that they were being brainwashed was gratuitous. Uh, the judge at one point, when the mother said that she just wanted her daughters to be happy, said, well, that this is the judge. That's easy, just put them on heroin. They'll be happy all the time. Mm -hmm. The mother, when she was explaining about the importance of going to powwows and shawl dancing, the judge stated that, well, if you've been in Austria with them, and if you'd run away to Austria, they would be in a deer garden twirling batons with their parents applauding, and they would be in their culture. They'd be in barbarous somewhere. The 
Judicial Council again says that stereotype of Aboriginal people is proper, reflecting vibes around them drinking, um, and it's a part of Aboriginal culture. So will this judge be removed? No, because there's no evidence of malice in these statements. Um, therefore, these allegations are not serious enough to be able to warrant removal. He apologizes and says, although I reiterate that I have not and do not feel any prejudice against Ms. Isaac or Aboriginal people, I acknowledge the words used to me by me are unacceptable. So as long as you don't feel prejudice and intend to be prejudiced, <laughs> game on in terms of not being removed from the bench. Now, I'm not excusing her behavior. Right? She took these kids away from California when there was a court order that prevented her from doing so. But her partner, who she's estranged from at that point, comes to the community, beats up her, beats up the 69-year-old grandma or her mother, and tries to take away, the, and, the, and the judge doesn't comment on that, considers this parent to be uh, suitable to uh, have a place in the court. So I don't excuse her, I don't excuse him either, I certainly don't excuse this judge, but this is not grounds for removal. Hopefully what you see in this is a little bit of, we still live in some ways with what we lived with in those early moments of encountering between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal decision makers. Really, you don't look like an Indian. That Pocahontas and the Washington Redskin and the Cleveland Indian. And we still continue to see too much of stereotype, too much of generalization. And my plea is not just for this to go one direction. Aboriginal peoples can generalize. Very damaging leap, that's the word. In the next class, we're going to pick up that aspect of this, which is when Aboriginal people's judgments go off the rails as well for making ridiculous uh, generalizations. But that doesn't excuse these generalizations either from the courts, from the social workers, from those who ran the residential schools. Um, this is a lesson here in what Nana Bush did, thinking, walking, looking at different angles, uh, not rushing to judgment, to use a little bit more of that in uh, this year in particular. So thanks for taking your Friday afternoon and I hope you enjoy it. I do appreciate um, that you're here and next Monday we'll uh, continue with this discussion. Dealing with self-government.